good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fiction panel here at Eckhart Public Library. <clears throat> My name is Allison, and I will be your moderator for this panel. Um, today with us, we've got our four lovely fiction panelists here from left to right. <laughs> we've got Gary Bowser. Um, Gary is a retired military official who has dedicated over 60 years of his life to the national security of the United States of America. He has served two years in the special operations during the Vietnam conflict. After that, he served overseas for over six years as a human case officer and operations officer. He had extensive experience in the Washington, D.C. arena as a DIA director of estimates branch chief, which involved drafting and coordinating national intelligence estimates and NATO military committee documents. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Um, after retiring from the USAF, he lived in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia for three years as an advisor to the Chief of Intelligence, Roy Royal Saudi Air Force. Gary has taught intelligence principles, clandestine operations, human collection procedures, and counterterrorism for Henley Putnam University and the Henley Putnam School of Strategic Security for over 13 years. He holds a Bachelor of Science from the U.S. Naval Academy, a Master of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from MIT, and a Master of Science in Political Science from Auburn University, Montgomery. <clears throat> Lieutenant Colonel Bowser was an instructor at the Air War College and co-authored their Soviet Studies course and related curriculum. He also instructed a graduate course in Advanced Guidance and Control Theory for Florida State University. He is a graduate of the Executive Program, School of Business, University of Michigan, the USAF Command and Staff College, the Counterinsurgency Course, and the U.S. Army Airborne School. He is the author of various monographs, articles, studies, and holds a number of patents in the area of X-ray security inspection devices. Operation Peregrine was his first fiction novel, and the second book in the series, Not On My Watch, is available now. <clears throat> you catch my breath. <laughs> You Welcome just have Gary. to be really old to get old. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, hey, you, you're very official. You, you know, know things. I didn't want to let you have the good <laughs> line. He didn't give you all the acronyms. I can condense that a little bit. Um, so welcome, Gary. And um, next to Gary, we've got Sophia and I. Um, Sophia has been telling stories since she could talk. She loves learning almost as much as she loves writing. Pursuing both her undergraduate and master's degrees, she has studied archaeology, anthropology, as well as the languages and histories of a variety of cultures. Her master's degree is in medieval history with a focus on the British Isles. She's been fortunate enough to participate in three archaeological excavations and surveys, one at a Native American settlement in southern Indiana, one at a Tudor estate in Essex, England, and one at an early medieval ring fort in County Rose Common, Ireland. After marrying her high school sweetheart, attending grad school, and moving nearly 10 times in as many years, Sophia and her husband settled into a lake house in northern Indiana. When she isn't working on her next novel, you can find her in the garden and covered in dirt. They live happily in the middle of nowhere, two little boys, two atrociously rude doggos, and one ornery cat. Her first series, Seasons of Scotland, is available through Amazon and Kindle, after winning the Right Stuff Romance Novel Writing Contest, Sophia's next series will be published by Dragon Blade Publishing. The first book, Song of the Fianna, is set to release this December. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you. You have the coolest publisher. Name. I know, right? It's such a cool name. <laughs> next to Sophia, we've got Stephen Faramelli. <clears throat> Stephen is an author and artist living in northern Indiana. He grew up in a small town in Illinois near the Mississippi River. Living a block from the town's library helped establish his love for reading at a young age. He first discovered he had an interest in writing after taking a science fiction course at a College for Kids summer session while he was in seventh grade. After receiving a BFA in illustration, he went on to a career in graphic design that took him to several states. He rediscovered his love for writing while taking the train to Chicago from the suburbs for work and began writing his first novel, Longhand, on those rides. When he isn't writing, he can be found working on possibly the longest house renovation in history, <laughs> restoring his 1978 Volkswagen bus, or at one of his children's sporting events. Welcome, Stephen. And then, last but not least, on the end here, we've got Nathan Marchand. I did say that correctly, right? I, no one can agree on how to say it. I say Marchand, but... Okay. Nathan Marchand hails from Fort Wayne, Indiana, homeschooled 
Starting in first grade, he discovered his talent for writing in sixth grade English when he was given the assignment to write a fanciful story. He attended Taylor University, Fort Wayne, earning a BA in professional writing. Since graduation, he's worn several hats. He has worked as a reporter, freelance writer, and English teacher, among other things. His first novel, Pandora's Box, was published in 2010 by Edge Science Fiction and Fantasy. He's also the co-creator of the ongoing fantasy book series, Children of the Wells, and the podcasts Monster Island, Film Vault, Hen Shunmen, and The Power of Trip, a journey through the Power Rangers franchise. His literary influences include C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Robert Heinlein, and Orson Scott Card. His favorite books are Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis' Space Trilogy, The Chronicles of Narnia, Starship Troopers, and Ender's Game. When not writing, he enjoys other creative endeavors like photography, acting, podcasting, making videos, and ballroom dancing. <clears throat> so welcome, Nathan, and welcome all of our authors. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead and get us started here with some questions for our authors, and any of you are, you know, feel free to um, respond, um, and then we'll take some questions from the audience in a little while. Um, so, of course, the obligatory question, what first interested you in writing? <laughs> Who would like to go first? She would. <laughs> I have the most boring answer. I'm serious. I just have always written. That's okay. I... <laughs> That's okay. Okay, I'm sorry. This answer is not super interesting. I've just always written books since I was in, I guess maybe in second grade, we had an assignment to write your own version of a mythological story, and that was probably the first thing I remember writing, and I just kept writing after that, so pretty straightforward. You had that in your summary. I know you did. You yeah. read it. <laughs> um, I was always an artist, so I... Um, I always wanted to tell a story, I think, and I finally realized that I couldn't tell as big of a story as I wanted to with my art as I could by writing. So that was how I started writing, basically. Uh, much like the, the two of you, <laughs> I, I think I've always tried to tell stories. I, I remember as a kid memorizing stories and recounting them to my parents or anyone who would listen, but the real story... It goes back to the what was mentioned in the bio, and I know you have a question about that specifically, so I will save most okay. of my answer for then. But yeah, that's what got me, got the ball rolling for me, was that sixth grade gotcha. English assignment. <laughs> I've uh, been writing things that uh, very few people were able to read because they were all pretty classified <laughs> for most of my professional life. And as I got here well down the road in my life, I thought about some things that I had experienced and knew that I thought were important for everyone to know. And was there a way to tell that story? And uh, historical fiction was the venue that I found where you could tell the truth as my truth, which I believe was the truth, and yet be within certain bounds of protecting people uh, who were friends of mine or people that were not friends of mine but still <laughs> needed protected. I call them protecting the guilty, and that included me. And also staying within the bounds of, of the classified information that we I knew, and that uh, actually were the heart of the story. So I try, I'm, I'm telling, not trying, I, I'm telling, and you can decide whether or not it's told, it's told well if you want to buy one of the books, <laughs> or both of them better. Um, <laughs> books. Was, oh, promotion. I <laughs> well, I'm doing the commercial. <laughs> <laughs> that it's a four book series, and it runs through secret intelligence wars that were going on under the surface, uh, particularly within the, for those of you who are historic uh, folks uh, or uh, old like me, uh, the mutual assured destruction. We lived in terror every day. We knew the Soviets could wipe us out in 30 minutes, literally. You pushed the button, the missiles came, and we had no defense. And 
the reciprocity of that mutual part of the assured destruction was we could do the same thing to them. There was a violent, on occasion, but most of the time nonviolent, but very intense intelligence war that went on to keep either side by the KGB and by us to ensure that the other guys didn't get an advantage to, uh, to disrupt or, or defeat the mutual assured destruction. And that's the story in these four books. The first two are out, and then uh, uh, I was part of it, my friends, and uh, hopefully you don't recognize any of us by name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so one of the things that I love about you guys is that you're only four people, but you all write such a variety of fiction. Have you ever written anything other than fiction, and would you like to? <laughs> Which one? You can start. <laughs> yes, I, I've uh, I've written a lot of nonfiction too. Sometimes I'm gonna just to be honest. That's actually an easier place to make some money as a writer is doing some nonfiction. But when I went to Taylor University, the writing program there trained us to write just about anything you can think of. So you know, for that reason, we wanted to have a a diverse skill set so that we had a lot of avenues that we could pursue a career, make some money and all that sort of stuff. But my first love in writing was fiction and the, it remains the the genre of writing I'm most interested in right now. Um, yes, I have written uh, nonfiction. I started out probably, oh gosh, 10 <coughs> plus years ago with a blog like everybody. Um, <laughs> and then I had another blog. Well, my first blog was about, I, I was doing art um, based on song lyrics. So I was doing digital art. I would take a song and then it was kind of really my evolution into writing, I would say. is like I was trying to come up with an idea um, to tell a story that was more than just the art. So it was kind of the blog went with that. I did a blog um, restoring my Volkswagen bus, um, so yeah, it's and then it just kind of evolved into. I think I'd rather do fiction, so <laughs> it's more fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wrote a couple of um, academic historical articles when I was in graduate school. I co-authored a book with my professor, and um, yeah, I had to write. I mean, like a you know my thesis and everything was published, so. That's um, I also messed around with the blog once upon a time. Uh, mine was recipes and gardening. Everyone is shocked. So um, that's pretty much it. I think I'm going to stick to fiction probably. Uh, I already commented that I've written a lot of official stuff uh, over the years. Uh, now I am working on these uh, historical fiction books, and I do a little blog occasionally on uh, our website, Gary Bowser Books. Uh, uh, that's, yeah, that and the grandkids are full-time job for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you all stuck with fiction, because that's why you're here, right? So when it comes to um, your writing process, everybody has different sort of process. So can you, what can you tell me about what your writing process is like? Um, so in the writing world, there's kind of, uh, there's two, there's like <laughs> plotters and there's what they call pantsers, mm -hmm. writing by the seat of your pants. Um, I'm kind of a pantser <laughs> in a way. Um, I, I do have in my mind, I kind of have like scenes that form and then I have, it always seems like the, I always have the end. I know how it's going to end. And so I just kind of fill in the, the spaces. Um, I know it's like story structure and what should be there. Um, but I don't, I don't like the, like the rigid, I would not be good with a rigid outline. I just, I'm like, well, if I do an outline, then what is the point of writing the rest of it, kind of a thing, so. 
It's interesting that you bring that up because when I first heard about that, and keep in mind, there are authors out there who are very successful doing one of these methods. A lot of them are outliners. You have to make, if you're going to go through traditional publishing, you have to make an outline anyway. You're just deciding when you're making the outline. Do you make the outline before or do you make the outline after? At least that's how it was generally done. I don't know if the practices might be a little different now. But there's also, you know, like I think the most famous example of a pantser who's successful would be Stephen King. He, when he starts a book, he has no idea what's going to happen. He just starts going, I'm like, and how do you get a thousand pages of not knowing? I, I don't get it. But the thing, I bring that up because I'm not quite in one camp or the other personally. I'm a little bit of an oddity in that regard. I swear I read Orson Scott Card was the same way. I like having a general idea, a general outline, but I always leave myself enough space so that I can come up with stuff on the fly as I'm writing. Because a lot of times I can come up with better stuff that way. Now, just one other thing to talk about writing process. I actually, does anyone else here like to listen to music while they write? Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I always do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's something that I will do, either like film soundtracks, sometimes I do the, yep. mm -hmm. the Mozart effect thing with, with classical music. I did that a lot when I was in, when I was in grad school. It might be why I had a 4.0 for, for a long time. <laughs> so, so that's something I enjoy doing. Okay, well, I am outnumbered here. Um, I am a, I call myself a planter, because I plan and then I pants. So, <laughs> Are there plants involved? I always. <laughs> he saw my office. <laughs> um, so I start out with what I call the brain, well, I always start out with research first, because my books are historical fiction. So I, I have a good background, especially for the British Isles, which is where they all take place, but I always, always, always have to research because there's always some aspect that I just haven't read about yet. So I spend probably 60 to 80 hours researching the material first to get a good background for story building. Uh, and then I do what I call the brain dump, which is where I just take everything I already know about the story and write it out. And it can be like really mundane things like the heroine has red hair. I know she has red hair, and that's it. Like, <laughs> just the things I know for sure. And then I build the story around that. And at that point, I start an outline where I do, I block out like the big five steps to make sure I know the general trajectory of the story, especially the ending, kind of. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, and then the next thing I do is I outline, well, and while I'm doing that, I kind of at the same time also do a really detailed outline of the characters, like who they are, who their family is, who their friends are, what their motivation is, why they're in this story, and what I want to change about them over the course of the story. Um, and then all of that helps me outline, I outline my book in quarters. So I will outline the first quarter of the book in pretty serious detail, chapter by chapter, scene by scene, and then I will write it. And the reason I do it, <laughs> quarter by quarter, is because I learned the hard way that no matter how much I plan, the ending always changes over the course of the story. So it's a waste of time to outline it at the very beginning. Because characters have a way of taking over a story, no yep. matter how much you plan. So, and I always leave them room to do that. Um, and there's always subplots that, like, in the course of a scene, I'm like, you know what would be funny? If there was a cat in this. Oh. You know? <laughs> And then there's suddenly a cat that I have to plan for later on. So I found, yeah, breaking it into quarters. Chekhov's cat. Chekhov's cat. He's in an upcoming book, actually. So <laughs> um, anyway, that's how I do it. And then you can always, editing is for taking the stuff that comes up at the end and putting it back at the beginning so that it all makes sense. So that's pretty much my process. I like your description. <laughs> historical fiction. The historical part is very important. Uh, you don't make up stuff. Uh, JFK was president at a certain time. Some things happened to him. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev did certain things. The head of the KGB was this guy. He did certain things. I knew these from my perspective in my own life. And, and so I do a lot of research because I can't always depend on my memory for 
particularly details of which restaurant did I go to back then. <laughs> no, this is very serious. For example, you go to Vienna, you have to have a soccer tort. It's, if you don't know that, you've never been to Vienna. And I don't know how many soccer torts I ate, but they're in the book. If you want to know, buy the book. <laughs> but, but the historical research, I agree, is very important, and I do this. Now, I know how my books end because I'm not making up the story as I go. But the intricacies of telling about your characters, <coughs> uh, of what you particularly, you know, my friends and so on, and what you reveal, you know stuff you would never tell about them to anybody, the key of anybody. But you also know stuff that you want to share. Uh, my, we have another question on this, so I won't. Anyway, I've rambled enough on this one. Uh, I love writing. I hate editing. I hate publishing. Uh, uh, I would like to sell more books, so you have to do editing and publishing to get it. Uh, next. It's a very honest answer. Uh, so I'd like to make sure we have some time for individual questions. I've got one each for each of you, so I'm just going to start here with you, Nathan, since... You happen to be closest. Um, so you mentioned in your bio that you first discovered your love of writing when you were asked, tasked with writing a fanciful story. Um, well, I guess my first question is, did your mom make you do that? Yes. Yeah, because you said you were <laughs> Well, it was, part, it was part of the curriculum she was using. Sure. So do you remember what that story was about, and is it, how is it similar or different than what you write now? <laughs> oh, do I remember? <laughs> <laughs> it, it all came about because there was another part of the curriculum that, that was, was in this. It wasn't an actual fanciful story that I had actually remember reading, I think, like a year or two before that. And so after rereading that story as part of the curriculum and then going over like the traits of a fanciful story and everything, then the assignment became Write Your Own. And if, I can't remember the title of this thing. It was some weird story. I swear some of these things were just written for this curriculum that was about food in a refrigerator coming to life. You know, and it had like, I, there was like a scene, and there were illustrations with this. There was a scene with like chocolate chips, like trying to, uh, floating on bubbles, throwing toothpicks at other food. You know, it was, it was weird. It was really weird. So I did something a bit similar to that, but I wrote, this is before Toy Story, I might add. I basically wrote a story about my toys coming to life and fighting each other. But it was really just an excuse to have all of my nerdy toys in an insane fan fiction <laughs> where they're all slammed together. So it's like Transformers and Star Trek and all these things that I was into. It was, it's an incredibly silly story, but I think it was called War of the Toys to boot. And I ended up writing them. Like, I made a whole series of these things, and they were all handwritten and all kinds of stuff. I even tried to do illustrations, and they're all awful. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, and it's stashed away someplace. If I dig around hard enough, I will probably find it, and nobody will ever read it. <laughs> all right. Um, so, Steve, you started writing your book, The Last Symphony, in 2016, um, long before the onset of the COVID pandemic. So, but there are similarities. So what similarities did you notice between your book and the real pandemic? <laughs> um, so I've always been a fan of kind of end of the world. Um, like Stephen King's The Stand, that's like probably my, one of my favorites. So that was this book. I, I saw a news article about a it was in the University of Ohio, or Ohio State. Um, there were some pigs that were resistant to antibiotics. And I just thought, what if there was some sort of a super flu that, it was kind of like a stand, <laughs> basically, that, like that nut, you couldn't treat it. And, and then it just kind of evolved from there. So I started writing, and um, I mean, it's, it's, it's got a lot of the stand, not really the stand, like the supernatural part of it, but... Um, there was a lot of that just whole thing, and then COVID hit, and then I, and I was pretty much done with the book, and I was like, uh, I <laughs> don't think I can put, well, I, could, I couldn't even write about it then, I was just, because I was just so caught up in it, and then there were, I mean, I had, I had 
people working from home. I had people wearing masks. I had like just because I, you know, paid attention to things that had happened in other parts of the world, like China, where people were always wearing masks and stuff. And um, yeah, so I it, it got a little scary. And like, and then I was just like, no. And then so then I got COVID <laughs> pretty bad. I was in the hospital. I was almost on a ventilator. So after that whole experience, I was like, I kind of need to just finish this and just put it out there. So I didn't change anything, and I put that in the foreword that this was written before COVID, but, and it has things that have to do with COVID, kind of, but I did, I never added that. You know, I never put that COVID world into, this is its own world of, like, non-COVID or before COVID, basically, even though it came out after COVID, so, um, but yeah. It was, so it's like my next one I was writing about, or have started is like a electromagnetic pulse, if any of you have heard of that, and I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't write this, because <laughs> I kind of don't want this to happen, but, uh, yeah, right, so. Speaking of right. All right, well, <clears throat> Sophia, um, how has your experience in archaeology and anthropology helped you write your historical fiction? <coughs> um, I actually, this is an interesting question because I would argue that it has helped me in that I have a really good baseline of knowledge to start from, and so I think that cuts back on the amount of research I have to do. And it helps me identify sources that I think are reliable and you know know how to use them and where to look and I know and I have a whole list of like places to look for specific types of information so as far as giving me a baseline of resources I think it's been really helpful but I actually think that overall it probably is more of a hindrance um, because I'm writing historical fiction and the period that I'm writing about isn't terribly well documented like it's pretty early in the Middle Ages and so and especially the British Isles in particular have not great documentation um, compared to like mainland Europe. So there comes a point where as a writer of fiction, I have to make a decision about something that there is just no, I, nobody knows. <laughs> They're like, well, it could be this or it could be that, but, and here's why it's this and here's why it's definitely not that. And, you know, I sit there and deliberate <laughs> about how I want to take it. And I think it really interrupts the flow of my creativity or I'll have them walk into a house and I'll be like, oh, I need to go, like, Google search and find some images because I can't visualize what this specific house in this specific place and time owned by this, like, level of society, you know, like, what it would look like. And I think it really trips me up and kind of interrupts my creative flow more than it actually helps. But, but my books are all very accurate. <laughs> so I guess yeah. there's that. <laughs> Boundaries. All right. Um, last but not least, Gary... Um, you have spent your entire life in the military in some capacity, so how has that experience helped you write your books? I know you kind of <coughs> talked about that a little bit already, but... Yeah, maybe I can give a short answer this time. <laughs> uh, it is my book. The, the series of books is my life experience and observation. That was, that that was great. That was concise. <laughs> So maybe you should be on the nonfiction panel. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably be in Fort Leavenworth in jail. <laughs> All right. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions? I'm going to go here first. I don't need a microphone. It's okay. okay. <laughs> I'm an actor. No. Um, so I'm a it's, yeah. it's interesting having a fiction panel going from historical fictions then sci-fi, and I kind of wonder, is, with among writers, is there like a hierarchy or a pecking order of like, because you think of it's like, you have sci, you know, sci-fi, which you could say has a basis in fact, if you really lean into science, and but like sci-fi fantasy versus historical fiction, and like I could see where some would maybe say that historical fiction is easier because you have the story of history to work from. But then I could also, <laughs> but I could also see where someone would say, "No, that's more difficult because I have to work within." Like you were, you were both saying, 
I have to work within the confines of actual history, whereas a fantasy writer gets to make up an entire world, but then on the other end, a fantasy writer has to make up an entire world, you know? Mm-hmm. So I wonder, like, among fiction writers, is there, like, a, a pecking order? Or a, like, a, do you guys get in fights? Like, uh, <laughs> yes, all the time. But um, I actually also write fantasy. So oh. I write historical fiction and fantasy. Okay. So for me, and I don't know if this is reflective of my background in history, the fantasy is way easier. Because I feel very limited by the qualities I can give characters based on people's perceptions of the past. Not even like what I've researched and I actually know to be more correct, but like, I mean, for example, the name Brittany is actually a historical name dating back to almost the Middle Ages. But if I put that in a book, you can bet your life there would be a comment on Amazon about how this woman has no idea how history works, right? Like, and I've seen stuff like that all the time. So, and I can't have heroines be too modern because someone will assume there were no women in the Middle Ages with their own opinions, which by the way, there absolutely were, but it's it's very limiting in the way I can portray characters, whereas with fantasy, I can just let my imagination go, mm-hmm. and I feel like it's very different in that way. Well, it's interesting you should bring that up because I don't know if anyone here is familiar with this, but there is a subgenre of science fiction called alternate history. Has anyone mm-hmm. ever heard yeah. that term? Yeah. Where you can actually blend the two. It would, it would require historical research, and then what these authors will do is they will change one event in actual history and then extrapolate what might have happened after that. A, a popular... There's, huh? there's a Stephen King book. Uh, what is it? 11, 22, 60. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was... Uh, well, uh, the example I was going to use because it just got made into a TV show a few years ago was The Man in the High Castle by yes. Philip K. Dick, where the premise of that is what if the Axis won World War II? And it's basically... And then you fast forward a couple of decades and the Axis now rules the world and they've carved up the globe into different regions. So some are ruled by Japan, some are ruled by Nazi Germany. I think the United States... And then I haven't read it or seen it yet, but I think the United States is run by Nazi Germany. Yeah, because there's a lot of Nazi iconography in the show. So yeah, so there's ways that you can actually combine it. And a lot of science fiction and fantasy authors will do historical research because they want to base the fantasy world in some form of reality, even if they don't necessarily portray it you know, historically accurate. Let me add one thing. I don't need the mic either. (laughs) Uh, Is there a pecking order? Yes. How much money do you make on your book? Most writers, I think, write for the fun of it, and uh, very few people writing make a living at it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a couple different pecking orders, uh, but uh, as in most things in life, follow the money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just creative. Just like, yeah, any yeah. creatives in general. That's, yeah. that's. I want to make one amendment. It's Tiffany, not Brittany. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got I got a friend who wrote like just recently got a couple books out. A Barian. She did the first two, and she did a children's book called uh, Fisherman's Gummy Worms. And she, yeah. I think she's been she wrote she's been writing since elementary school, oh. and then she she lives right around Auburn. So, <coughs> She's pretty good. I got a couple of her books. That's awesome. Why? Your last uh, answer kind of leads into mine. What's each of your publishing stories? Like, how did you get there? How did you find a publisher? Are you self-published? What, you know, what's your story there? Should I just ditch the mic too? I have a really funny story about that, and I, I love telling this story. I've done both traditional publishing and self publishing. I remember for my first novel, I had spent way more time working on that than I wanted to, and I didn't have an agent. I was a first time book author, so I, I knew I was going to run into some resistance trying to get it published. So I started going to some smaller publishing houses. I submitted to one, it got turned down, submitted to Edge Science Fiction and Fantasy, and uh, I didn't hear from them for a few months, and then I emailed them and said, hey, did you get my submission? And they said, oh yeah, it's in the slush pile. 
I don't know if they still have slush piles, but slush piles are what publishers call unsolicited manuscripts that are very unlikely to get published because they get a bunch of them. So they went and found it. I waited a few more months. I contacted them again, and they said, oh, yeah, it's gone through this level of editors and everything. And then I just kept bugging them. <laughs> I kept bugging them to the point where I would call them up, and they would and get to get an update, and somebody told me, oh, everyone knows you by the name in the office now. <laughs> And finally, after, oh, geez, I think it's, the publishing industry is the slowest industry you'll ever get involved in. And I think after a, I think close to, I see nine months to a year, I finally got a call from the head of the publishing department, of, of, the, of the publishing house, so it kept getting progressively higher. And he called me up, and he said, I like it, we're going to publish it. And it took everything in me to not scream in the phone. <laughs> <laughs> in exuberance. So my advice to first-time authors, if you want to go the traditional publishing route, first off, submit as much as you can. And two, if you start making some progress in a publishing house, be tenacious. Generally speaking, they'll either look at that as a good thing or they'll put a restraining order on you. One or the other. <laughs> um, I'm self-published. Um, and I was listening to a lot of self-publishing podcasts, if you any of you are familiar, like Mark Dawson, Joanna Penn. Um, there's, there's a ton of them out there. And I, the more I listened, I don't know if it just influenced me, but basically I, I wanted control, especially over the cover, because I'm a graphic designer. I wanted to do the cover. Um, I didn't, I just, and I didn't want the, the, the hassle, the time, you know, of like trying to find the publisher, is this the right fit, the agent, all of that. Plus, when you get right down, if you want to sell books and make money, you're going to make way more self-publishing if you're, if you're the type that can promote it and that sort of thing. So for me, I basically, I made an LLC and I made my own publishing company so that, and I bought some ISBNs and basically, you know, I could publish someone else if I wanted to, but it's basically just for me so that I can do what I want to do right and, you know, the art and not have to worry about somebody saying, oh, no, I don't know about that. So that's kind of my story. Um, I do a hybrid. So I self-published the series that I'm selling today over the last two years. I started publishing in 2020 during COVID because I had to stay home with my kids and it was driving me insane. So <laughs> my husband's like, why don't you write some books? <laughs> um, yeah, so I wrote most of that series from 2020 to 2020, early 2022. Um, and I self-published those like you. I listened to all the podcasts. I read all the books. I have like my entire bookshelf of like marketing your book and all that kind of stuff. And He's absolutely right. You'll make way more money if you self-publish and you're able to market it effectively. I do mine as a sole proprietorship right now, but probably I will incorporate eventually. Um, but then I saw a ad on Facebook for a writing contest, and the prize, the grand prize, was a publishing contract with the biggest publisher of historical romance that's a non-traditional house. They frequently have people in like New York Times bestseller lists and things like that. And I won the contest. So my next series is going to be published through that. So I'm only a little jealous. <laughs> I won no contest. <laughs> it's a hard act to follow. Uh, self published KDP, Tyndall Direct Publishing, is easy. Uh, you can write a really trashy book and get it out there. <laughs> He's right. He's absolutely uh, but true. What I, what I found out was I think the, the traditional uh, publishing industry is uh, dead men walking. They don't know it, but they're mm -hmm. over. Now, right now, today, they're very powerful. The agents think they're uh, God's gift to writers, and uh, you want to meet a bunch of rude, uh, mean-spirited people. Send some stuff to agents. Most of them will ignore you. Occasionally, you'll get a snotty reply. I dropped that after I was slow to learn. I had sent several of them out. Uh, I believe uh, also that uh, 
a, a writer, and, and I'm speaking only in my case because I don't know a lot of writers, I met some today, <laughs> uh, and have a couple other friends that are uh, upstairs with their books. It's a team effort beyond getting the first story together. You need editors, you need people to help market, you need a website. I have a super webmaster that runs my site for me. Uh, you need family support. You need people to critique as you go, particularly in, I think, in historical fiction, to make sure you've got the flow of the story. And, and the, the, the key thing is, if they don't like your characters, you're done for. If you have a lousy story, no matter how good a writer you are, you have bad results. If you are uh, a, a great writer and have a bad story, you still have bad results. So <laughs> there, but you know, if, if somebody out here is thinking about writing a book, go for it. The self-publishing part is easy. Being uh, making money, that's tough. <laughs> I feel like I heard somewhere that basically Amazon is its own publishing company where yeah. you can sell they own KDP to Am okay yeah it's like I feel like I heard that and they they don't it's not like they have warehouses full of books no it's like, they print, print on demand print no they print, print on demand print on just like their name is print on demand you yeah. for example you you go through a real uh, process with Amazon before they accept. Yeah. Except your tags and your cover and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, once you get in there, you can buy author copies where you basically don't know how much Amazon makes on the author copy, and then you can sell them like today uh, yourself. Amazon rips you off on the royalty. They they are they kill you because they are so powerful. Sure. But it's still better. Than uh, let me give you the numbers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you don't yeah. believe me about it, the numbers. It's uh, KDP also has the biggest reach uh, compared to some of the other publishing websites, self-publishing websites, and I think that's it yeah, depends. that's a big thing. If you it, want to play in the game, the you have to too. play with Amazon. But Amazon does this to you when you sign up with them. We will be your sole agent, and if we are your sole agent, you can get seventy percent commission on the profit side after the shipping, after the, uh, uh, the print costs, and so on. But if you want to sell a book off your website, or here, or Barnes & Noble, you get a 30% commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It also depends on if you're, um, the price point you're asking. You, you have to ask above a certain price to even get mm -hmm. the 70%. $2.99. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but Amazon also uh, part of the agreement is they can change the price without your uh, even asking you. I've had this happen to me several times in, uh, through Amazon, and they've unilaterally changed the price. They set your price? No, you no, you, you, you no, you, you, you set, set the price, but they if you sell it somewhere cheaper, and Amazon with their powerful networks find out, they will lower the price on Amazon to match anything you're selling somewhere else. So I recommend for anybody interested in learning how to manage Amazon and KDP, look into David Gogren, mm -hmm. Joanna Penn, like you said, and yep. Mark Dawson, and that will give you an amazing baseline to work <coughs> from on launching your own publishing. You know how to spell Gogren? Yes, I do, unfortunately. G-A-U-G-H-R-A-N. He is a delightfully bearded Irishman with a full-on accent. He's fun to watch <laughs> yeah. and knows a lot about Amazon. There's a free site, uh, yeah. Dave Chesson. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Kindle yes. Yes. H -E -E -S -O -N. Yeah. And he does, uh, he really specializes in trying to help you navigate Amazon. Yeah, he's good. And you just sign up and get a free newsletter from him. And I know, like, we're running out of time, but if you guys are around and you have any questions, you can ask any, any of us, because we've yeah. all been through this. So. Yeah, we, are, we are unfortunately out of time, but <laughs> <Yeah>. they are, <laughs> you guys have all been great, I love it. Uh -huh. um, but they will all be out at their table, so you should definitely go um, say hi, stop by and get some more information. Um, so thank you guys for being here. And thank you. Thank you.